Take your Bible today and turn, will you please, to the last book in the Bible, chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Now the message and the singing today, the music of course, will be on tape number 374. I'm speaking on the subject, supper time. And you can write in and get this tape, just call for the tape, supper time, or tape number 374. And close a gift of $3 or more to help take care of our expense. And we'll send you the tape. And you'll have it there to listen to or pass on to others. Uh, if you'd like to write in and get my book on Bible questions and answers, I have five of these, as I mentioned several times. On page 7, of book number 3, you'll find the answers to these questions. What men in the Bible lived seven days with the wrong woman before he got the right one? What woman stole her father's God? That's uh, God with a little G, of course. And then where do you find great, a great wrestling match in the Bible? What man kissed the corpse of his father? Who was born with a scarlet thread upon his hand? Where in the Bible did it become so dark it could be felt? Where in the Bible did God tell a man how to make some perfume? Where did God say he would rain bread from heaven? What Bible character in his last performance brought down a house? What is meant by the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 9 where it says it's better to marry than to burn? A lot of questions, a lot of people ask that question since I've been on the radio. What, what does that mean? What is he talking about? Where in the Bible does both men and beasts go on a fast? Who did God say in the Bible like to call their land by their own names? What men in the Bible put a fleece to find the will of the Lord? Put out a fleece, rather. Uh, when did the stars of heaven fight against a man? What men in the Bible was put to death when he could not pronounce the word correctly? What husband was better to his wife than ten sons? You find the answers to these on page 7. Uh, book number three, if you'd like to have all five of the books, you send in a gift of $10. If you'd like to have the one, a gift of $2, or get it right in the mail to you. Why don't you pray for us and write to us and work us together in getting out the gospel. You out in the radio listening audience, uh, some of you write in and tell what the broadcast means to you on Sunday. You look forward to it. Many of you precious shedding people can't get out and go and travel like others. And you listen to the broadcast. You enjoy the singing of the message. I'm glad you do. Well, you can have a part in it because it is a faith ministry. By writing to me, my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. Turn, please, to Revelation 9, chapter 19. I heard a bit of good news this morning. The good news was the old Ayatollah died. Should have been dead a long time ago. But uh, that's a matter of when God got ready to cast him down into hell. And the world's far better off with that bird gone down there with Hitler and Stalin and the rest of them, of his type. And uh, he's caused the death of many of our young men and the death and suffering of multitudes, thousands. He always called America the big Satan. Well, that devil is gone. I'm glad he's gone. And I wish he had died a long time ago because he'd never be saved. A man like that would never get saved. He doesn't even believe in Jesus Christ as being a God or he just thought he's another man on the scene. He believed in Mohammedan. And he's leading and led multitudes and multitudes to hell with him. And it's pitiful. It's a shame. But the world is far better off with, without him because he's called un, caused untold damage in the world. And so the Ayatollah is dead, thank God. All right, uh, Revelation chapter 19. There's a little boy going fishing one Sunday morning. Met the doctor. And the doctor said, son, uh, where are you going? He said, I'm going fishing. The doctor said, do you have worms? He said, Mama said I did, but I'm going fishing anyway. <laughs> All right, Revelation chapter 19. And uh, we begin reading with verse 5. 
Revelation chapter 19, verse 5. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sins of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he saith unto me, See thou doest it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of the brethren that have the testimony of Jesus worship God. By the testimony of Jesus. If you notice in verse 9, he mentioned there the great supper of the Lamb. I'm using for my subject this morning, supper time. I'm going to mention several occasions where it was supper time in the Bible. And then we want to apply it to our hearts in a spiritual manner and see if it won't help us. And see if we can't learn a lesson from the periods of time when they call supper time in the Bible. I was born and reared a country boy, and all, we always had supper uh, at the close of the afternoon toward evening time. A lot of these city slickers, they don't have any supper. They'll just have uh, breakfast and lunch and dinner. But uh, we had supper, and we still have supper at our house. I was born to believe the time for supper is in the early part of the evening at night time. And so we're going to talk about supper time. They had supper time in the Bible. And so I want to mention several occasions where they had supper time. It all comes at the close of the day. Now there was a supper time that cost John the Baptist his head. You may say, preacher, how did a supper time cause him his head? Well, the Bible says in Mark chapter 6 verses 21 through 24... And when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a great supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced, and pleased him, and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give thee, give it unto thee. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, Ask the head of John the Baptist. Now when this little girl danced before the wicked, drunken, ungodly king and his friends that assembled there for that great occasion, then he was so carried away in, in a drunken stupor. He said, just ask what you want and I'll give it to you. And so she runs to her mother and she says, Mama, uh, King Herod said if I, he would give me whatever I asked for, could you tell me what to ask for? Mother said, yes, I know exactly what you ought to ask for. Go in there and tell him that you want the head of John the Baptist in a charger. Now, John the Baptist was in prison. He was put in prison there because he told King Herod it was wrong for him to take his brother Philip's wife away from him and, from him and marry her. And that he did. This young girl belonged to Herod's brother. And she was only a stepdaughter by marriage. So he just took his brother's wife away from him and his daughter, of course. And when this Baptist preacher came on the scene, he drew no punches. He shelled out the corn. He chopped the tree and let the chips fall where they may. And he told the king and his wife, he said, it's dead wrong. You're living in adultery. You've taken your brother Philip's wife and it's wrong. You shouldn't have done that. Now, no doubt over Herod said, now that man, does he really know that I'm a king and he's talking to a king and he's referring to a king's wife and, and his stepdaughter? But that didn't scare old John. He went ahead and preached and told him, he said, it's dead wrong for you to take your brother Philip's wife away from him and now you're living with her. Now, of course, whenever his wife heard about it, the woman he's living with, of course, Philip's wife, then it made her so angry. She hated John. She said, I'll see him put to death. I'll have him killed. If it's the last thing I ever do, that Baptist preacher's got to die. 
He should know better than try to uh, separate us or say it's wrong for me to have Herod as my husband and, and I'm going to have him put to death. And so she delighted in the fact that she could make a choice about what her daughter should require. And he, she said, go and tell him to bring in the head of John the Baptist. Now, John was down there in prison, not very far from the palace there, evidently. And the soldiers went down and they cut that preacher's head off, put it on a charge and brought it back and gave it uh, to that woman. And there she saw his head on that charger. I imagine she's seen it millions and millions of times since then, down burning down in hell without a doubt. She could just see old John's head, maybe over and over again. She had his head cut off. Now, of course, he'll get his head back in the resurrection, but she'll be tormented forever there without God, without a doubt. Now, Jesus said there's not a greater born of woman than John the Baptist. Now, of course, he's talking about John's position. Positionally speaking, there's not a greater person on the earth than John the Baptist. He had the privilege of introducing Jesus to Israel. He had the opportunity, the privilege to baptize the Son of God. And positionally speaking, there's not a greater man on the earth at that time that had that great honor bestowed upon him than John the Baptist. Now this is up a time that old King Herod will never forget. That little gal that danced before him, she'll never forget this supper time. And his wife, of course, the woman he took from his brother, she'll never forget this supper time. It's one they'll always remember that the old Baptist preacher lost his head because he preached against sin and they remember it the rest of their days. Supper time number two is a supper time of excuses. In Luke chapter 14, verses 16 through 18, then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they, with one excuse, uh, began to, they, one consent, rather, began to make excuse. Now, this was a supper time that the king had provided for the people to be brought in to the great banquet. He wanted to have a good attendance, he'd gone to a lot of trouble. And this certain man made this great supper. He was a man of authority. And of course, after having provided the meal and the table set and everything in order, he sends out at supper time to invite the people to come in. And if you read Luke chapter 14, you find they went out inviting people to come to the supper. There's a great banquet down at the banquet hall and you're invited to come. In fact, they, the uh, rule is expecting you to come. And the Bible said they all with one consent began to make excuse. One man said, I bought a piece of ground, therefore I can't come. I, I'll have to go look it over. That's kind of foolish to buy a piece of ground. I haven't looked it over, but that's what he did. He made a foolish excuse. There's another man said, I bought a yoke of oxen. Now I'm going out here at supper time to break in a yoke of oxen. Well, it's quite a job to break in one oxen and break in a yoke at supper time. Kind of sound a little silly. And, but he said, now I got to go try them out, break them in, get them ready for business. Excuse me, please. I don't think I'll attend the supper. Another man said, well, I married a wife, and therefore I won't be there. Now here's a man here that put his wife between him and the um, king in that respect that he uh, packed the blame off on his wife. I married a wife and therefore I won't be able to be there. Now who would like to enjoy a great supper any better than a young bride, a young woman? She, she would uh, uh, delighted in going to the banquet. She would not have had to fix the meal herself. She could have gone down and sat out and had a good meal already prepared. And yet he used her as the excuse. He said, I married a wife and therefore I won't be there. So this supper time is the time of excuses. You have a lot of people a day that make all kinds of excuses. I could write a book on them. If I had all the excuses that's made to me when I'd invite people to God, invite people to the church, I could write a book. I tell you, some of them are real hilarious. Some of them, uh, you just uh, uh, wonder how in the world a man could think up such an excuse as that. I remember several years ago, I invited a man to come to Northside. I said, we'd like for you to come to Northside and uh, be with us in our church services. He didn't live too far from here. In fact, 
over on the old Hull Road. And uh, he, I invited him to come to Northside, be with us in our service. He said, Preacher, I'm going to tell you the truth. He says, like this. He said, uh, you know, I just, uh, I just can't make it up them steps out there. He said, I just, uh, I just can't go up steps. And uh, therefore, since I can't make it up those steps out there at Northside, I, I just won't be there. Well, we don't have step one out here in front of our church. You come straight in off of the pavement, right into the vestibule, right into the church. Not a step out there. Now, he, he couldn't come because of the steps out there. Now, people make all kind of silly excuses as to why they don't come to God, why they don't come to church. And I'll tell you, some of them are just downright silly, really. Somebody said an excuse is just a little a lie. Some call it maybe a little white lie, and it's such thing as that. But they all one consent to make excuses. Now, that started back in the Garden of Eden. That's where all excuses started. That's where we, they came from and why we have them today. Uh, when God came in the garden in the cool of the day and said, Adam, where art thou? And began to inquire about the situation. What did Adam do? Adam said, this woman you gave me, she's to blame for all of this that's gone on here, eating of the fruit and so forth. And he blamed it all on his wife. And of course, uh, whenever uh, God talked to the woman, she blamed it on the serpent. As we always blame things on others. Still a lot of men today blame their devilment on their wives. When they know their wives are innocent, they got to blame it on somebody. So they blame it on their wives. Or maybe the wives blame it on their husbands. We got to find somewhere, uh, somebody to put the blame on to make an excuse. We won't be honest and just come out and say, well, we're guilty, we're wrong, we just, just don't want to get right with God, we don't want to come to church, and that's it. And the new invitation went out to those that would come, and they came, a new invitation. Now the man said, you go invite to, uh, this fellow that doesn't have a, a land to go see, bring him in, a blind man, he can't see land anyway. And you go out and you bring in the lame man, the man he can't walk, he couldn't uh, break the yoke of oxen because he can't walk, and go bring him in and so forth. And uh, so he told them to go out and bring these in. And, and they, so they went out to invite these, and they came in. But the other people that turned down the invitation, while well, they didn't have another chance. The Bible said they'll not be invited, those who refuse. For I say unto you, verse 24 of Luke 14, I say unto you that those that were bidden to my supper will not come. They'll now not be invited. They'll not have another chance to come. So it's always dangerous whenever you make an excuse. God may take you at your word. There's a man one time went into a, a beer joint and he wanted a certain type brand of beer. And the man said, I don't have that type brand. And he said, well, I'll get me that type brand if I have to go to hell after it. He went out and got in his car, was already half drunk, went out on the highway and ran off the road, ran into a sign. And it happened to be a sign advertised the same type beer. And a portion of that sign penetrated into the man's heart and killed him instantly. He said, I'll have my type beer if I have to go to hell after it. Well, it's pitiful that no doubt he died and went to hell, but uh, probably without getting his type beer. There's a man in Greenville, South Carolina, at the time I lived there, that gambled. These men would meet out and gamble. And this man was very desperate. He had lost his money. And he took all of his money that he had left and put it on the table. And he said, if I lose this money, I hope I'll drop dead. And the man played the cards. He lost the money and fell over dead. And so we need to remember a lot of times the things we say and do could be very, very dangerous. Number three, there's a supper time where the first recorded words of Judas are found. Have you ever thought about the first recorded, actual recorded words of Judas, where they're found in the Bible and what he said and what he meant and why he said it? Well, it's found in John chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead. And when, he, when he'd raised from the dead, or whom he'd raised from the dead, there they made him a supper. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then saith one of his disciples, 
Judas Iscariot, that Simon's son, which betrayed him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Now here at this supper time at the home of Mary and Martha, we find the first recorded words of Judas Iscariot. And Judas Iscariot was a treasure of the group. He carried the money bag. And he was fussing because they anointed Jesus with an ointment. And it was very expensive. He said that ointment could have been sold. And we could put the money in this bag. And then we could have given it to the, given it to the poor. Now the Bible tells us he wasn't concerned about the poor. He was concerned about getting that money in his hands. Put it in that bag because he was a thief. He wanted to steal the money. That's why he wanted it in the bag. And here you have the first recorded words of Judas at supper time. Not only that, but notice what he's doing. He's, he's uh, deviating the mind of the people from the person of Christ to the poor people around him there or in the village. Now that, that's a, the trick of Satan to do that. If the devil can get your mind off of the, the person of Christ, that Christ is God, God is our Savior, and worship Him, and adore Him, and serve Him, and get your mind on helping the poor out here, then He'll do that and have you believing that you go to heaven because of that. You'd be surprised today to know the people that's thinking they're going to heaven because they've given to the poor. Now, there's nothing wrong in giving to the poor. You ought to if you're able to do that. But don't depend upon that for your own salvation. You have a lot of movements today that give a charitable means to various reasons and purposes. And they do it thinking God's going to let them go to heaven because of it. You don't go to heaven by helping the poor. You go to heaven by repenting of your sins and taking Christ as your Savior. So Judas is cat, the devil through Judas tried to distract or take the mind of the people away from the person of Christ. They were worshiping the Son of God. They had anointed the Son of God. They were bowing at the Son of God, worshiping Him. And the devil said, get those people's mind away from that man and get it on the poor people out in the community. That's exactly what he tried to do. Let nothing take you away from your contact with God, your worshiping of God. These other things you need to do, let that be secondary. Then number four, we have the supper time where Jesus went out into the night. You know, uh, brother Judas went out into the night. Judas went out into the night, not Jesus. In John chapter 13, verses 2 and 30, And supper being ended, the devil had put down in the heart of Judas his cat, Simon, son, to betray him. He then, having received the sop, in verse 30, went immediately out, and it was night. Now when Judas his cat rose from that table to go out and betray the Son of God. He went out into physical darkness and also in spiritual darkness. And it had to be awful dark that night when this man turned down his last chance and walked out, turned his back up on the Son of God to go out and betray Jesus. It was, a, it was darkness in his heart and life. And there's always darkness in life of that sinner He's already blinded to the God of this world system. But when he turns his back on God and says no to Jesus, that's a terrible darkness to that individual. That's what Judas Iscariot did. He went out in the dark, away from the light of the world, out in darkness to betray the Son of God. He's going away from the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then we find light number, uh, supper number four rather, uh, number five it is. And uh, it says uh, in John chapter 13, verse 4 and 5, that supper time where, where Jesus taught humility. Supper time where Jesus taught humility. John chapter 13, verses 4 and 5. He rises from supper and laid aside his garment and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now here at this supper time, we find that Jesus is teaching humility. The wash of feet in those days taught humility. Now that's not a, a church ordinance today, although you have some that practice foot washing. Now I don't guess I hurt a man's feet, get them washed once in a while, but that's not a church ordinance. 
You only have two church ordinances in the Baptist church. That's, of course, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so Jesus here is teaching humility. He said, now you do as I have done. Now what did he do? He humbled himself. He taught humility. You be humble like I am. That's what Christ is talking about. And we're to serve each other. In verse 7, what I do thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. They, they, they knew he was washing feet. They knew that. But he said, the real meaning of what I'm doing here, you haven't grasped it yet. You don't realize what it is yet, but you'll learn, you'll know. And it meant to humble yourself and serve each other. Be willing to wash a man's feet if need be. Be willing to, to help the sick. Be willing to do what we can. Humble ourselves and be willing to serve God and serve each other. And here at the supper table you find humility at the supper table. Jesus teaching humility. And you must keep that in mind. Then we come to supper number six. And that's a marriage supper of the Lamb. That's why my text was read, Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, white. For the fine linen is the rights of the saint, saints. And he says unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage of the Lamb. So here you have the marriage supper, the marriage of the Lamb, where you sit down at the table there at the supper, uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's going to happen in the future. Uh, you have an invitation to be there, and you will be there if you're born again Christian. You'll be there at the marriage supper. Because when the rapture takes place, we're carried to the judgment seat of Christ. There we judge according to our works and rewarded, and we move from there to the marriage supper. There'll be a great supper set for God's people, the church, the born again believers. And so this will be a supper where we'll all be together, all of God's people, all of your loved ones that's gone on before. They'll be there, we'll all be there at the great marriage supper of the Lamb. What a supper that will be. It'll be a time when we'll put all of our feet on the table just alike. All just alike at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Be no crippled people there. Be no blind people there. Be no sickly people there. We'll all be just alike. We'll have a body like unto the Lord's. And we'll all sit at that table. We'll all put our feet on the floor just alike. All under the table just alike at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'll all sit down together with the saints of old and with our loved ones that's gone on before. Then we come to the final supper. That's supper number seven. That's a supper of the great God. In Revelation chapter 19, verses 17 through 21, the Bible said, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of the kings, and the flesh of the captains, and the flesh of the mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them. And the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horses and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped the image. These both were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horses, which was set upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now this is what is called the supper time of the great God. Now this will happen during the tribulation period, at the close of the tribulation period, at the battle of Armageddon. When the battle of Armageddon is fought and there will be multitudes slain, men and horses will die on the battlefield over there in the valley of Giddo, Mount Giddo, and the valley of Mount Giddo. They'll be there and they'll die and their bodies will be all over that huge place over there. And I've been there many times, I've ridden by there many times, and it's a, it's a beautiful Territory. More war has been fought there than any other place around Israel except around the gates of Jerusalem. And so people be lying on the ground, killed after the battle of Armageddon. Multitudes, blood will flow the horses' bridle. And then God's going to call in the vultures. 
God's going to call in the buzzers, if you please, and the vultures that eat human flesh. God's going to call them in. And they're coming in there by the thousands. And they're coming in there to pick the flesh off the bones of the men and the horses that will be killed during the battle of Armageddon. Somebody said uh, some time ago that they see more of those uh, flesh-eating vultures now in that particular part of the Middle East and any other place in the world. Sometimes we wonder, well, maybe if what, God may be causing them to multiply and getting them ready. Of course, God don't have to call them to, to be hatched and born in creed if he wants to and just say, I want a million buzzards out there and they'd be there. That's all God have to do because he's God. But there are a great number of buzzards being seen over there now in that era that has been in the past, I understand. I've had read, about, I've read about it and, and men said it's, it's actually true. But it'd be the supper of the great God. After the battle of Armageddon, and when God takes care of that situation, kills out the armies of the earth, and slaughters the, the armies of the earth, and the armies of the Antichrist, then the Antichrist and the false prophet and the beast, they'll be put in the lake of fire, where they'll be tormented forever and ever. And then Jesus sets up his throne upon the earth, and rules and reigns on the earth for a period of a thousand years. But these great suppers I've mentioned, I hope you'll take them to heart and realize what happened at these suppers. The supper of the great God. You don't have to worry about that because you'll be in your glorified body. You'll come back with the Lord. Revelation chapter 19. God will take care of the armies of the enemy. God will settle that. And then God will lift the curse from the earth. And the earth will be a wonderful place to dwell on during that time. That thousand year period. And so there's great things in store for God's people. I was reading the other day about this preacher from Atlanta many years ago, a great Baptist preacher, and uh, he was telling about what happened up here in North Carolina back in his ministry. And he said a man came into town. That's back in the days when they drove in their wagons, their carriages, their buggies. And this man came in. He had some nice prancing horses and a beautiful wagon with spring seed and straw in it and painted very beautifully. The wheels all painted and he was kind of a wealthy man to be able to come into town riding on a wagon of that type. And he stops his horses and he goes into the store. He gets sugar, coffee, flour, whatever he needed for groceries back home. And he puts them in the wagon. And whenever he put the groceries in the wagon, he was getting ready to leave and something scared those horses. They began to stand up on their hind legs and, and paw and uh, and attempt to run off. And the man ran and grabbed one of them by the bridle, by the ring. And there those horses started down the street. And he was holding on. And Peep was begging him to turn loose. He said, turn loose. Those horses are going to kill you. Their front feet kept hitting the man, breaking his bone, cutting his body. But he just held right on. And he held on until finally the horses stopped. And when the horses stopped, then his body fell to the ground. They had killed him. People gathered around and they wondered, why? Why did that man do that? Why would he hold on to those horses knowing they would, they would pour him to death? Why would he do it? About that time, out from under that straw in that wagon came a little blue-eyed, blonde-headed boy raised up out of that wagon. He was under the straw and he came out. They said, yeah, I see now why that man was trying to stop those horses. That was his little son in that wagon. And he was willing to give his life to save his boy. And he did give his life, and his boy was spared. Now, this preacher said that's a true story. Happened in the state of North Carolina, and the preacher was from Atlanta, Georgia, many years ago. Now, that's what Jesus did. Jesus gave his life that you and I might be saved, that we might go to the great supper in heaven, the marriage supper of the Lamb. He'll be ready for us and waiting for us after the judgment seat of Christ. If you're not saved, you ought to get saved today and be ready to go. Thank you. You've listened well. Let's all stand to our feet. Father in heaven, I pray today you'll take the message and use it to your glory. May your name be honored. May Jesus be glorified and always say do. Our God, we thank you for the great supper. That one day we'll attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. Thank you, our Father that we're part of that bride, and we're looking forward to the great supper in due time. 
Now have your way in the invitation. Speak to the radio listening audience. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Debbie, you play stanza so far. So and maybe somebody here would like to move out for some reason or another. If you want to come down, rededicate your life, uh, get saved or join the church or whatever. If God's speaking, would you come while she plays? We're going to give you ample time to respond. Just come right ahead. Right on down to the front. Let's help you. better time would you find that now if God is speaking 